This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Well, good evening and welcome to the Birch Aquarium at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. My name is Nigella Hillgarth and I'm the Executive Director at the Birch Aquarium and it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Dale Stokes. Dale Stokes is a research oceanographer in the Marine Physical Lab at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and he received his BSc degree in Biology and Geology at Queen's University in Canada and then he received his PhD in oceanography right here at Scripps. And his work was emphasizing the biomechanics of marine larvae. He then left Scripps for two years and went to Stanford, but he soon came back <laughs> and has been at the marine physics lab ever since, the physical lab. And together with another Scripps colleague, Dr. Grant Dean, they formed the uh, Marine Technology Lab here at Scripps, which is a, a, an amazing place that designs and builds unique scientific instruments uh, for researchers at Scripps and around the world. And so Dale has a very diverse background in biology and in physics, and so he works, not surprisingly, on a lot of different things. He works on polar ecology and coral reef ecology, internal waves, and air gas, um, air sea gas transport. That's just to name a few things he works on. And in fact, his work on bubble formation in breaking waves and his co-discovery of a previously unknown photosynthetic community beneath the ground in polar deserts was recently reported in the scientific journal Nature. And his field experiences include multiple um, ship and land-based research uh, projects around the world, I think uh, three times in the Arctic and four in Antarctica. He's also a very distinguished photographer and his work has appeared in many different places including National Geographic, Ocean Realm, BBC Wildlife, Skin Diver, National Wildlife and many others. He's also worked on many um, f documentary film projects as a scientific advisor and in fact as cameraman including that wonderful series, the BBC's Blue Planet, and the PBS Nature Under Antarctic Ice, and most recently, the wonderful 3D IMAX film, The Wild Ocean. And he's also worked on another 3D IMAX film that's coming out next year, that's the threatened uh, coral reefs of Palau. Uh, he says that his strangest uh, film project and recent one was shooting underwater footage in northern Canada for the History Channel's Ice Road Truckers. <laughs> so please welcome me um, in, uh, join me rather, in welcoming him tonight on his talk entitled Adventures in Oceanography. I think we're going to have a wonderful evening. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Comprehensive introduction. I would like to uh, give you something a little different this evening. Uh, rather than giving you a lot of science, I'm going to ask you to take your thinking caps off tonight and just enjoy some, I think, some pretty pictures from around the world. And I'd like to start by saying I really consider myself one of the luckiest people around. I come to work every day here at Scripps, which is, you know, arguably one of the most fantastic uh, research institutions in the world. Uh, I get to work with my colleagues on all sorts of fascinating projects. In fact, I don't even think of it as work. I think of it as play. And people ask me what I do, and I say, ah, I really just play. You know, I get up in the morning, and I can't wait to get into work because I get to play all day long. And it's only in a place like Scripps that you can do that sort of thing. Some people play um, is a little different than other people's play. Uh, <laughs> This is a photograph from an experiment we've been doing um, in shallow water acoustics. And here's a colleague of mine playing. Um, in this case, playing means monitoring six or seven computers all at once. 
Now, this is really what we do most of the time. We spend most of our time working with computers, analyzing data, writing proposals, writing papers, you know, tracking down grant money. And, and that's 90% of our work as a scientist. But I discovered not too long ago that if I gave a talk about what I really do 90% of the time, everyone bolts for the door because nobody wants to hear about you know, days spent sitting in front of a computer typing up lab reports. So instead, I'm going to show you, you know, what we do that other 10% of the time, or at least what some of us get to do. I lied when I said there wouldn't be any data. Uh, here it is, the one and only data slide, uh, just kind of showing some of the interesting things we're doing down the hill. We've actually discovered a way of calibrating bioluminescent plankton. Now these, if you go out in the summertime, you see these wonderful glowing tides, the red tides that glow when the waves break. We've been able to go in and calibrate those plankton and then use them as individual sensors within a breaking wave. And we're doing that to figure out how much energy is being moved around when a wave breaks. And we're very interested in that because it tells us how bubbles form. It also tells us how gas is moving between the ocean and the atmosphere. That's it. The science is over. As we go through this presentation, I'm going to try and take you through a series of scales. And all, these, all the oceanographic work here at, at Scripps, um, it's, well, we're really not just doing oceanography. I, I think it's best to just call it, we do Earth science. Oceanographers study you know, our planet Earth, which is you know, almost three quarters ocean. And we do this with a whole variety of different tools. And the largest scale we work on is, of course, the scale of the entire Earth. And we do that through satellite imaging. You can see the Scripps satellite dish here. And, and this is a, a map of global sea surface temperature taken by satellite. So oceanographers do explore the ocean from these incredibly large scales, not just fishes and dolphins and those sorts of things, but the entire planet as a whole. I found myself as an oceanographer working not just in the ocean. Um, a lot of Earth science that relates to the ocean uh, takes place on land. This is up in the high Sierras, and you know, we're walking along a glacier here, or the remains of a glacier, and you know, they're actually little time machines. You can dig down through a glacier and look at all these layers within the snow and go back in time and learn about the Earth's climate, about rainfall and precipitation and snow records in the Rockies. We've also been working on a series of sampling projects that deal with extremophiles. I think other scientists here at Scripps have talked about extremophiles. But we're very interested in the specific microbial communities that live around volcanic vents. And these are vents up on land. And we've sampled a series of volcanic vents, um, actually now all around the planet. But this series was done in the Cascade Volcanoes here in the United States. And this is going down into a steam crater at about 14,000 feet. And we're collecting the microbes that live in these uh, really extreme environments around these hot steam vents. And the way these organisms live here and around hydrothermal vents provides a lot of information about, well, perhaps a life could live on another planet. Oceanographers and geophysics, in this case, takes place in deserts. This is, you know, this is the Al Gadones monument just on the east side of the Salton Sea here in Southern California. And that whole area around the Salton Sea is a very active geologic zone. And there's faults and whatnot. And there's been a series of seismic measurements made all around the desert southeast by Scripps scientists. Moving a little farther away from home, 23 million years ago, a meteor about a kilometer across smashed into the planet up in what is now Devon Island in the high Canadian Arctic. And it blasted out a crater when it hit about 25 miles across and about, about a mile and a half deep. And it blasted all these hundreds of thousands of millions of tons of rock up into the atmosphere. And it came raining back down on the Earth and has formed a really spectacular frozen crater. Now, this is very interesting for scientists, particularly other Earth scientists who are interested in Mars. Mars, it is believed, has a very similar terrain to what's found in the high Canadian Arctic, this sort of frozen permafrost. And this region provides 
an area where scientists can go and study geologic landforms and these sort of post-glacial processes that occur and you know, or might occur on a place like Mars when a meteorite hits. It's a very spectacular landscape and it was a funny place to find myself but I had a colleague who called me up and said, um, what do you know about Crater Lakes? And I said, absolutely nothing. And he said, well, would you like to go up to uh, Arctic Canada and Devon Island and study one? I said, absolutely. So off we went. And we were actually there to study um, these, the life inside the Crater Lakes. And it's, we were also able to name one of the Crater Lakes. It was a Scripps Lake up in the high Canadian Arctic now. And we had our little rubber inflatable boat. And we would row out onto these lakes and do our sampling underneath the ice that was there. A large part of the time in the very short Arctic summer was spent digging ourselves and the vehicles out of mud. And the top frame is just showing the looks of the camp in our second season. Um, it was already starting to grow. When we first arrived the year before, there was only six of us sort of dumped out of a twin otter on the side of this little stream, along with an Inuit hunter and a bunch of sled dogs to keep the polar bears away. And when we finished up the project, which is continuing to this day, it has been taken over by NASA. And it's called the Houghton Mars Impact Crater Program. And now there's buildings, and, and they do Mars simulations. And it's, it gets rather surreal now when you go up there. Um, we would be working in our little rubber boat in one of these lakes, taking our samples. And on shore, you'd have these guys testing Mars you know, spacesuits, take me to your leader. And they're, they're kind of walking around. And there'd be 10 engineers running along behind them. Um, taking notes and whatnot. It, was, it sort of turned into a bit of a carnival, up, a carnival of scientists up in the high north in the summertime. When we think normally of oceanography, we think of men going down to the sea in ships, of course. And this is Scripps's latest ship. This is the Ravel when it was in dry dock. And it was having a new uh, multi-beam sonar installed on its hull. So I took these pictures. And you can see it's marvelous. Z drive system here, these large propellers at the stern that can articulate 360 degrees and help the ship uh, steer in all directions. Scripps is, I think, most famous ship, and certainly famous to the people in this room, is FLIP. It stands for Floating Instrument Platform, and it was built in the early 60s by the Marine Physics Lab for doing some really wonderful deep water acoustics work. And it still goes to sea. It's a marvelous, marvelous machine. And if you don't know, um, it's towed into place. It's a, over 300 feet long. It looks sort of like a baseball bat. And there's no engines. It has to be towed by a tugboat. And it's dragged out to sea into position. And then in about 45 minutes, these tanks flood along the hull. And it goes from lying horizontal in the water to lying vertically upright. Now, why we do that is because it moves the center of mass of the ship and the center of buoyancy of the ship very far below the ocean's surface. Now, if you think about the ocean when you look outside, it's the surface that's bouncing back and forth with the waves and the swells. So if we move the center of mass and buoyancy of the vessel very far below the surface, like on flip, it becomes a very stable platform. In fact, when FLIP is operating, it's almost like it's nailed into the ocean surface. And it doesn't move, and the ocean dances around it. So it provides a marvelous platform. And you lower these large booms off of FLIP in three directions. And that's what we use to suspend our instruments at the sea surface and deeper down within the water. I'm getting used closer and closer to the ocean. You know, we, we've, we've gone from satellites to ships. So we're, we're bobbing around on the water now. And you know, for, for years, for centuries, actually, we've been having to bring the ocean back up to the surface for us to study. And we do that still. And we do it uh, in, in some very simple ways. And we do it in more complicated ways. But um, up in the upper left, we can see a box core. That's a very simple device. It's lowered off a ship on a big winch. You can lower it down thousands and thousands of feet. It triggers on the bottom. And it takes a big chunk of the seafloor. And then you winch it all the way back up to the surface. And then you very carefully dig through the sediment that's come up in that core. And you can study the organisms. You can study the sediments. You can do all sorts of science with that. Very basic. And it's still used to this day. It's very important. 
In the center is sort of a sophisticated current meter, and that's a type of device that gets lowered off the side of the ship, and in this case, this is up in the uh, inland passages around Vancouver Island and some very strong tidal currents. And this device uh, floats along and monitors incredibly fine changes in ocean currents and ocean temperature as it cruises along underneath the surface. On the far right is something even more sophisticated. That's ATV. That's the Advanced Tethered Vehicle. It used to be run solely by the Navy, but now Scripps has it. And this is an autonomous, not an autonomous, I'm sorry, a remotely operated vehicle, an ROV. And the scientists and the operators sit on board the ship, and then they have up to 6,000 meters of this yellow cable that spools out to the top. You can see this white an orange uh, box. It's about the size of a Volkswagen minibus. It's actually a very large ROV. And it's got manipulators and all sorts of cameras on it. And this is lowered off the ship and driven down to the bottom. And you do the science by you know, looking through TV monitors on the ship. And you can see the bottom and, and manipulate experiments and recover items. It's actually a very, uh, a very important and very efficient way to work in the ocean. Um, rather than getting wet, you can leave this in the water for hours at a time. It doesn't get tired. It doesn't get cold. You know, it doesn't get seasick. So um, you see more and more remotely operated vehicles. And they're playing you know, very large part in oceanography now. On the bottom left is you know, a little retro now. This is a, a midwater trawl. And again, we still use these when we go to sea. And this one is being rigged to sample sort of in the, uh, let's say, deeper water from 1,000 to 2,000 feet beneath the Pelagic Ocean. And these are, again, towed behind a ship, very simple. And they're fished for a while, and they're brought to the surface. And then organisms are collected out of the cod end of the net. That's the little bucket at the end of the net that collects everything that gets sucked in the mouth as it's dragged along. And here's just an image of some of the, the wonderful creatures that we get uh, in those, uh, those pelagic midwater trawls. And we have the famous viper fish here, Coleotis, on the left. We have uh, Chiasmodon. That's that great fish that you might have heard about that swallows fish bigger than itself. Its whole mouth just opens right up and gobbles them up. And then this is Melanocostius here on the lower right. And it's uh, another sort of uh, fearsome looking critter of the deep. And all of these actually have very marvelous bioluminescent organs on them that produce their own light beneath the sea. They're just spectacular, spectacular animals. And I think you know, it's great for us, and it's great for most things in the ocean, that just about all of these organisms would fit in the palm of your hand. They're not very big, um, but they're certainly fearsome for their size. If you're a little shrimp, you'd be terrified. <laughs> So we're slowly getting a little more intimate with the ocean. And it's one thing to send a robot down to the water, but there's still times when you actually want to get a set of human eyes down on the seafloor. And this is, uh, I guess, one of the most famous submarines that's still working. This is Alvin, which is run by O&R and Woods Hole. And I've been lucky enough to do a few dives in Alvin. And you can see it here with the Atlantis, its new mothership. And it's here in the water, and it's all rigged to do a series of sediment cores. And I worked on a project with an ex-scrippy named um, Craig Smith, who's now at the University of Hawaii. And the whole project was looking at what was settling in the sediment and along the carcasses and bones of dead whales. So here's a shot of, of uh, one of the divers rigging one of these whale carcasses to sink down to the seafloor. We sank a total of four of them, I believe, and I, I could gross you out with all sorts of stories about dismembering whale carcasses at Camp Pendleton with a fire axe. You know. uh, we did some really neat stuff for that, uh, for that project. And I can also tell you that if you spend an afternoon crawling around an inn, a dead whale, you smell for about a week. It, you just can't get rid of it. It's horrible. When you go to do a dive in Alvin, this is what you see. You, I'm crawling down, down this, the ladder, this little ladder that goes inside that little top section of Alvin into um, the main sphere of the, of the submersible. And it's got all the comforts as home, as long as your home is only about seven feet from side to side. And in that seven-foot sphere, you pack three people and all the equipment that you see there. 
So I'm about to go down these stairs, and I'm going to slide right underneath there by that guy's foot, by that camera, and then sort of sit like this. And then you take turns stretching your legs out. And you do that for about nine hours, depending on the dive. And then you get to look through a little viewfinder, a little, a little viewport about this big, which is positioned right about here. So then you, you kind of go like this for nine hours. And then you get a sore neck. And then you actually spend most of your time looking at a little television monitor inside Alvin, because you have cameras that you can move around, which goes back to ROVs. It's really, you're just kind of being like an ROV. It's the pilot who gets all the fun in Alvin, actually. He has the best window, and he gets to work the manipulator arms. Uh, the scientists, were, we just get to tell them what to do. Most people aren't familiar that there were other the so-called white boats, these white boat submersibles. There was Alvin, which you've seen pictures of, and there were two others, Seacliff and Turtle, that were operated by the deep submergence unit of the Navy. And they were based here in San Diego. And we were fortunate to do dives with all three of these submersibles. And this is Turtle here being launched. And uh, Seacliff is very similar looking. And the other white boats have, have been retired. Um, they're no longer around and no longer working. Um, in fact, the titanium sphere out of Seacliff was taken out of the submersible and put inside Alvin when, um, when it was retired because it had a deeper rated sphere. So now it's inside Alvin. On the right is another submersible I've worked with. And this is one of my favorites. It's the little yellow submarine Delta, which works up and down the West Coast. And it's quite small compared to the other you know, larger submersibles. It just fits two people. And whereas the white boats could go down to maybe 6,000 meters, the, uh, the little yellow submarine Delta is good to about 500 meters. But it's a marvelous machine, because unlike the white boats and unlike Alvin, where the pilot gets to do all the fun stuff, uh, when you're in Delta, the pilot sits sort of like in the Beatles' little yellow submarine with his head up in here looking out the portholes, whereas the scientist lies up along the front and looks out the front ports and gets to work the manipulator arm. And for me, that was you know, the whole point of going down in a submarine was to be able to move that little arm around. Even more intimate with the ocean is now getting wet. We're not, we're not in a machine. We're swimming around. And, and most oceanographers don't actually dive. Um, they might do it for recreation. It's very exciting. It's, uh, it's uh, a wonderful thing. But um, in fact, our group is one of the few groups that does do a lot of diving on, on projects around, around the world. And diving tends to be cold. and. Uh, you really can't spend that much time in the water when you go for a dive. Um, usually an hour or so is about all you can do, depending on the depth. So it's, it's not a very efficient way to do a lot of work. But um, we still do it. And here you can see some pictures. This is, this is actually a Scripps Aquarium collector. And this is working off of uh, Catalina Island, collecting for the aquarium. In the center, this was filming uh, Blue Planet. And we would go out, and in this case, um, we're using closed circuit rebreathers. This is a fancier type of diving apparatus that, that doesn't make any bubbles. And, and it lets us spend hours and hours and hours at a time in the water. So we would go out, and we would be dropped off by a boat underneath one of these things, which is a kelp paddy, which is a broken off raft of kelp from the shore. So this kelp can be torn up in a storm, and it floats out to sea, and it forms a raft. And it just bobs around. And this thing way out in the ocean becomes a magnet for life. You get all sorts of creatures that are drawn into these kelp patties. So we would go out with our gear, and we'd flop in, and the boat would leave, so it wouldn't scare anything. And we'd sit there underneath this kelp patty for you know, afternoons, waiting to see what would swim up. And uh, we saw sunfish and mako sharks and all sorts of things that would eventually kind of swim in and, and check out what was going on in these kelp patties. On the far side, this is another type of diving that we do. This is. Um, this is mixed gas diving. When you want to dive a little deeper in the water, you start having to use some exotic gas mixtures to breathe because it, uh, it clears your head. I don't know if people are familiar with diving, but um, when you normally breathe air under pressure in, in deeper water, it acts as a narcotic. The nitrogen in the air that you're breathing 
uh, acts sort of like alcohol in your, in your brain, and it mixes you up. So if you're going to do diving deeper than about 150 feet or 200 feet, you start taking the nitrogen out of your breathing gas and replacing it with helium. So we're doing heliox diving here, and we go down to about 300 feet that way. And you can actually dive a bit deeper than that, but it, it's, again, it's not a very efficient thing to do. Um, and we try not to do it unless we absolutely have to. But that's sort of the technology that we can use, and you can tell it's, it's, it's a little, it's heavy, you know? <laughs> you jump in with 200 pounds of gear on, and, and it's, it's kind of hard to work. But it is something that we do. And not all the diving that we do is um, exciting and fun. Um, here's uh, a member of our team coming out uh, in the middle of winter, you know, on the East Coast in the Northeast, and he's in a full dry suit, and he's got a, uh, he's actually wearing a communications mask uh, so he can talk while we're working. And most of the time it's, you know, I'm extremely cold, I'd like to go home, is it, are we done yet, you know, is it Miller time? Um, so most of the scientific diving is not the wonderful diving out on the reefs, although this is what I'm going to be showing you pictures of. Um, but that is a lot of what scientific diving is about. It's, it's being cold, wet, and miserable in places that aren't really that attractive to dive in to begin with. People always want to ask about sharks. Sharks are fantastic organisms, absolutely beautiful. Uh, this is a sand tiger shark on the east coast on one of the World War II wrecks off of North Carolina. Marvelous, marvelous creatures. You usually never see them when you dive. Um, not just scientific diving when you're sort of concentrating on the job, but most diving, it's very unusual to actually see sharks now in the water for various reasons. Um, this is a, a shot on a reef out in the Tuamotos, and this is how it used to be in a lot of the Pacific settings where there was sort of large schools of these uh, reef sharks, these black tip reef sharks and gray sharks. And that was a common sight, and unfortunately, that's not the case anymore. Most of these large fishes have been, have been uh, caught, or they've just disappeared because the ecosystems are a little out of balance. So it, it's, it's a real treat when we get to see sharks. Sort of the iconic shark is, of course, the great white shark. And um, I feel very lucky to have dove with the white sharks. And right now, one of the most spectacular places to do that is very close to San Diego. It's on Guadalupe Island in Mexico. And the water's clear. And in the fall, large numbers of uh, very large white sharks show up to feed in the area. And they're absolutely stunning organisms. Um, there's, uh, it's very hard to describe the feeling that you get when you're um, in a cage and, and you look between your legs and you see a fish that's uh, you know, 14, 15 feet long and uh, as wide across its back as your whole, you know, as, as you can reach. They're unbelievable animals, absolutely unbelievable. The sharkiest place, if you could call it that, that I've ever worked was fairly recently. And this was for the IMAX film, uh, Wild Ocean. And this was a project looking at the incredible sardine migration that occurs off the southeast coast of Africa. Now, there used to be large schools of sardines around the world. We used to have them here off the coast of Monterey and California. Large fisheries um, have essentially decimated most of the populations. There's still a very uh, enormous sardine population off the southern tip of Africa. And a fraction of that population migrates up the east coast of Africa into this area of the Trans Sky, which is sort of um, uh, halfway between Durban and Cape Town. It's a very isolated section of the coast. It's, it's very hard for people to get in and out of the water, which is why they haven't been fished very heavily. And this large uh, pile of sardines migrates to spawn. And then it attracts dolphins and whales and sharks and all sorts of organisms from all over that part of the ocean to come and feed upon them. So we were there to film this. And we did it with IMAX. Now, this is a new type of IMAX camera system. It's 3D. And it was developed by uh, James Cameron for his uh, 3D Titanic projects. And we were given permission to use them underwater for this project. 
And normally an IMAX camera runs on film. I don't know if you're familiar with the IMAX format, but it's that big film format. It gives you these spectacular images and whatnot. But an IMAX camera normally has a three minute film load. So that's it. You press the button and you have three minutes. And then you call everybody over and they spend an hour changing the film and whatnot. And you went for three minutes and that cost about $30,000 for the film and the developing. It's very expensive and not very practical for doing this type of diving. Uh, the 3D IMAX film rig is about the size of a Volkswagen Bug and weighs almost 2,000 pounds. So you really couldn't go bouncing out through the surf uh, with the film IMAX camera and, and get any work done. So this is a new technique. It's all digital. And it's two sort of 250 pound pieces. So that's a little more manageable by three people. And we were diving in the area there for quite a while. And um, working with the spectacular migration, you can see in these, the visibility is very bad there, but um, you can see these uh, shoals of sardines. You can see these diving gannets. They're a, a seabird that can dive down to almost 40 or 50 feet chasing the sardines. And on the right, you see a better shot of the camera system there. The, you see the uh, main person looking through the viewfinder and then a secondary person who's actually running the recording unit. It runs into large digital decks inside this second unit. And then there's an umbilical between the two. And that gives you 20 minutes at a shot instead of three. So we were out there doing that for eight weeks. And some very, very big fish. Um, and these were all, unfortunately, the bitey kind of sharks. That's <laughs> the ones we call them. There were um, bull sharks and tiger sharks and dusky sharks and bronze whalers. And um, they like to nibble on people. And we were, uh, when we did our diving with the camera, we were sort of busy most of the time. So we had um, two bodyguards with us who were uh, South African Marines who did nothing but kind of stay on your shoulder and, and bop sharks out of the way with clubs. And um, <laughs> we got some great footage. I don't know if you saw the film. Um, it was playing in Balboa Park. But um, the sharks were everywhere. And um, you know when you got out of the water onto the little Zodiac and the Marines were all going, whoa, you know, it was, um, <laughs> it was pr pr pretty bad. <laughs> but nobody was hurt. We were actually using, um, uh, they're called shark pods. And they're, they set up a mag an electric field around the diver. And we had a couple of these units that you could turn on. And you could actually watch a shark come swimming up get within a couple of feet and then veer off. So they helped a lot. Um, but it was a, a spectacular example of sharks. Um, just to, this is here, an interlude to get us away from the sharks. This is just some beautiful reef footage. This is again out in the Tuamotos. Not all the diving that we've done uh, on our projects is in the ocean. Uh, this is actually, um, I've worked with a group of uh, explorers and some hydrologists. And this is in the jungles of the Yucatan in Mexico. Um, this part of Mexico is absolutely riddled with uh, freshwater caves, some of them many, many miles long. And we've been going down there in the summertime into the jungle and uh, exploring some of these caves in, in, in what is a very fragile uh, watershed. It's unfortunate that there's this enormous quantity of fresh water very close to the surface here that's rapidly being polluted uh, by development along the coast. So uh, that's one of the things we're involved in. And, and getting out in the jungle is usually a bit of a, bit of a trick sometimes, loading up uh, ornery donkeys with dive gear. They don't always go for that. Now, the most intimate way of working in the ocean is actually living in the ocean. And I've been able to do a couple of these saturation projects. Now, this is at the uh, Aquarius Habitat in Florida. It's in about 60 feet of water off the Florida Keys at Conch Reef. And saturation diving um, is getting back to what I was talking about with the gas mixtures and whatnot. If you go diving, I'm sure most people have at least heard of the bends. So the longer you spend underwater at pressure, your body starts absorbing nitrogen out of the air that you're breathing. And when you come back up to the surface, you have to let this nitrogen 
come back into equilibrium with the atmosphere. It has to come out of solution in your body. If you go down too deep and stay too long and come up too quickly, that gas comes out of solution too quickly itself and forms little bubbles and you know, can get in your nerves, it can get in your circulation system, and divers get the bends. If you really want to spend a lot of time in the water, what you do is you saturate your body. So you go down, you go for a dive, and once you've spent a certain amount of time at a certain depth, your body can't absorb any more nitrogen. It's fully loaded, it's saturated. So what we do is we go down, and you stay in this little habitat, and you work there, and your body becomes saturated. And it's not a problem because you never go to the surface. We would stay down there for 11 to 14 days at a time. And at the end of the entire project, that's when you do your decompression. You don't do it at the end of every dive. You do it right at the end, and you get it all over with you know, as the last thing you do. But it takes 18 hours to get back to the surface safely. So that's saturation diving. Here's another shot of the habitat. This is from the other side. Um, this little thing here is called the gazebo. Um, the kids love that because that's where you go to the bathroom. Um, you'd think living in the water, it sounds very romantic, but it's really not. Um, <laughs> uh, we'd like to think we're fish, but we're not. And humans are not supposed to spend 24 hours a day wet and you start to kind of rot, I think is the best way to describe it. Um, you get a lot of blisters and sores and you never really dry out and you get ear infections and your lungs hurt and, and uh, it's, it, it becomes considerably less romantic after three or four days. Um, <laughs> it's, still, it's still fun, I mean. Uh, on the right is one of these little diving bells. They're, they have several of them on the reef. When we're staying in the habitat, we have up to nine hours at a time out on the reef at the depths that we're working. So we can get an incredible amount of, uh, incredible amount of work done. But to do that, what you have to do is you swim over now and then to these little bubbles, and you can fill your tanks up on your back so you, you, know, you keep topping up with gas, and then you can drink and eat and whatnot during the day. So we just kind of work in and out of these little bubbles and then swim back to the habitat at the end of the work day and eat and sleep. Here's just a couple of pictures. Here's, here's a script scientist. This is my colleague, Jim Leichter. He and I are down there doing this kind of thing. He's taking some notes uh, in between dives. Here's one of our employees actually going out to do a dive survey from the habitat. And here's someone else on the right, and that's starting to undergrow this 18-hour decompression to, get, to come back up to the surface. You just kind of lie there with a mask on your face and, and hope for it to be all over soon. Diving isn't just in the tropics for us, and it isn't just about you know, reef fish and, and those sorts of things. We have a large project uh, that we wrapped up in New Zealand, and this is in the, on the South Island, Southwest Coast, in the fjords of New Zealand. And we put a series of instruments out there to study what are called internal waves. And internal waves, um, if you're not familiar, they're um, just another form of wave, very similar to a surface wave that you're very used to looking at when you go to the seashore. And all that is, is energy moving across the sea surface, and it's sort of trapped between the ocean and the atmosphere and the energy travel, travels along this interface. Now there's other interfaces in the ocean, not just the surface. And a, a thermocline is one, so where you have this really rapid temperature change. This acts sort of as an interface that energy can move along. And these are internal waves, and we've been studying these. And they're very spectacular in a place like a New Zealand fjord, because what you have is it's raining all the time on the South Island. It rains a lot. The snow melts, and you end up with about up to 30 feet of fresh water sitting on top of the ocean in these very deep fjords. So you have 30 feet of extremely cold. It's just a couple of degrees above freezing, very murky. It looks sort of like coffee, lying right on top, slightly warmer, crystal clear seawater. And this forms an incredibly sharp boundary. And it's a great place for us to study the propagation of internal waves. So that's what we're doing there. Ah, uh, the tropics. 
<laughs> we're actually studying these internal waves in the tropics as well. And this is actually putting out an acoustic current meter to look at some of these things. And we also have larger arrays of sensors that we spread across the bottom. And what we're doing is we're studying the way these deep water internal waves, as they roll and approach an island, they can slide up and down the sides of islands and up and down the sides of coral reefs. And what they do is they inject cold and nutrient rich water from the deep water up into the shallow shelves and along the corals. And these lush coral reefs actually get some of their energy from internal wave transport. And this is something that's relatively new to uh, coral reef ecology. This is a beautiful example of a coral reef that's still in very good condition. Many of the coral reefs around the world are in very bad shape. I'm sure people are familiar with that from the other talks here at, in the forum. Um, this is a very isolated reef um, out in the French Tuamotos, close to where the French were doing their nuclear bomb testing, actually. And there's not much human impact. It's still relatively pristine. That's sort of looking the way a very diverse, exciting reef community should look. We're also looking at these same mechanisms in the Caribbean. And last year, we did a large project with NOAA looking at the coral reefs and some of these transport mechanisms on the island of Bonaire, which is just off the coast of Venezuela. Now, Bonaire is famous because it's had one of the longest running natural marine reserves, um, well, actually since the late 1970s. It's been very well preserved. But it, like most of the Caribbean, has lost nearly 80% of its hard corals. And this is a place that's been incredibly well protected. So we did a series of, well, we had some uh, autonomous vehicles, sensor arrays, and whatnot. And we did a series of deep trimix dives here um, down to about uh, 85 or 90 meters, um, looking at these communities that are supposedly in very good shape. And unfortunately, this is kind of the thing that we see if you think back to that beautiful picture from the Tuamotos, this is what we're seeing around most of the coral reefs in the world now. It's obviously very sick looking. There is a little bit of live coral left, and there's some sponges. But you can see this red stain. Well, that's actually um, sort of uh, an invasive uh, microbial mat that is growing over what used to be coral. This is this sort of green-gray section that is a tunicate. And this was uh, a species of, um, in this case, colonial and mat-forming ascidians, kind of like a jellyfish, but not really. Um, and these actually came over from the west coast of the Panama area and are now spreading throughout the Caribbean. And they don't have any natural Caribbean predators. And what they do is they overgrow and smother the coral. And behind them, if you lift that up, it's just dead. It looks like it's being bleached white. And there's black band disease. There's a whole series of diseases, invasive predators, microbial mats, all these sorts of things devastating the Caribbean reefs right now. And we're trying to get a handle on really why some areas are still living and why others are dying very rapidly. Just last fall, so just a few months ago, we finished another project. And this is a new IMAX project using the latest digital IMAX technology. This is the next step past that first one that you saw. And this is another 3D system. It was used for the first time, looking at some of these things I've been talking about with coral reefs. And this is out in the islands of Palau. And we're spending most of our time looking at some of these very tiny organisms that people usually are not familiar with when they think about coral reefs. And there's all sorts of wonderful nudibranchs and worms and close-ups of coral polyps. Here you see a tiny, tiny hermit crab. They're about the size of your little pinky. And instead of living inside shells, they live inside the abandoned worm tubes inside coral heads. And they never move. They just sit there. And then you can see a, you know, a classic anemone fish. And it was sort of very amusing to me anyway. We would swim this 400-pound IMAX camera rig up, and we'd spend the whole day filming something you know, this big, just a few, uh, just a few inches uh, from the front of the viewport. 
We were also given permission to dive here, which is inside one of Palau's meromictic saltwater lakes. And this one is very famous for its enormous uh, population of a jellyfish. And there are hundreds of millions of jellyfish that live in this lake. And they sort of follow the sun around. It's a very fascinating environment. And we were permissioned to dive in the area uh, with, again, with rebreathers, because they're very worried about mixing the lake. They don't want bubbles stirring the hydrogen sulfide and some of the uh, chemistry in, uh, within the lake to disrupt the jellyfish. And we got some really stunning footage of these dense clouds of, uh, dense clouds of jellyfish and, and the way they interact with the shore and with the sunlight. And I'm hoping that it all turns out really great next year uh, when, it's, when it premieres. The last environment I'd like to talk about is the Antarctic. We went to the North Pole, and now we'll go to the South Pole. And I see Dr. Coyman out in the audience. And he's, he's very familiar with all of this. Um, I'm almost embarrassed to be up here talking about the Antarctic with uh, Dr. Coyman. Um, but this is a view of, of the Erebus volcano on Ross Island from the sea ice. And doing science in the Antarctic has an incredibly long history. I mean, this, that was really one of the main reasons scientists went to the Antarctic. I mean, why people went to the Antarctic was to do science and, and explore. And this is a, an image of Shackleton's hut at Cape Royds, and you can see um, the outside of their hut here where they stayed, and a lot of the provisional boxes around. And this is, that's an actually an Adelie penguin colony in the middle part in the Antarctic, Trans-Antarctic Mountains in the background with McMurdo Sound in between. It's an absolutely stunning setting, and I've been very fortunate to be able to work down there. This is inside one of, one of the explorer's huts, a Scots hut, I believe. Um, very well preserved in the very dry air of the Antarctic. Um, when they dug these huts out of the snow, you know, a lot of the, uh, or most of the internal items and the provisions are all perfectly preserved and they've put them back, back up the way they used to be. It's, it's really a little time capsule when you walk inside one of these huts. You have to have a picture of penguins if you're going to talk about the Antarctic. So there's my picture of emperor penguins looking very uh, imperial. And I always like to show this sequence because people never believe me when I tell them about this. But uh, it's very incredible. If you go work out on the sea ice, just about every single time you do this, you can be flying out to wherever, out towards the ice edge, and you see absolutely nothing out the windows of the helicopter. And then you land, and you go about your business, and you still haven't seen anything. And then you turn around, and you look back at the helicopter, and you see this. And what it is is. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it happens just about every time. They appear from nowhere, and they have like a cocktail party around the helicopter. <laughs> and, and they're all deciding, you know, what is going on. And they're f just marvelous animals, and they, they're very curious and uh, just a real special, special treat to be able to work around. And of course, the, the consummate divers themselves, this is a Waddell seal. Working and diving in the Antarctic, to me, seemed to be a very big exercise in digging. Uh, we would dig out our ice holes. We would dig out the snow cats. We would dig out the snowmobiles. And we would dig out the dive huts. You have to like shoveling snow. If you're working close to one of the major bases, like McMurdo, to get into the water is actually pretty easy. We use this rig here. It's sort of a modified post hole drill rig except that it has a, a three foot wide blade. And it, it actually quite quickly chops a hole through anywhere from six to 10 feet of ice. And you go about your dives. Um, another way we get into the water is um, if you're working around some of the cracks in the sea ice, you can sometimes sort of worm your way down through a little crack, or you can open it up a bit with a chainsaw. We'd often get these around um, some of the grounded icebergs. And you could go in and out of the Waddell seal holes. You just kind of think thin and kind of scooch through. And you know, often it was sort of like at least coming in and out of sort of a giant margarita. <laughs> now, this is, a, this is a great picture. This wasn't taken by me. This was taken by um, actually an ex-Scripps student 
uh, Norbert Wu. And uh, it's a picture of me actually filming uh, Desmonema, a large Antarctic jellyfish. And uh, gigantism is a sort of a, a very prevalent biological adaptation that you see in the Antarctic where some of these organisms have reached very large size uh, living at the poles. This is a, a great example. These here are, but they look like icicles. Well, they sort of are icicles. They're, they're known as brine channels. And when sea ice forms, you end up freezing seawater on the ocean surface and you form a heavy, very cold brine that doesn't freeze. And this brine percolates down through cracks in the sea ice. And then when it hits the seawater underneath, it's so cold it actually begins to freeze the seawater around it. And it forms a very delicate hollow tube that's uh, pouring out uh, super chilled brine out the bottom of it. And they form these very delicate uh, ice brine tubes. And this is just a close up of, of another uh, Antarctic jellyfish. And I really like this one because it's, it's peppered with a parasitic amphipod that all these little specks along its bell are little tiny amphipods that have hitched a ride on this jellyfish. And they spend, I'm sure, their whole life just sort of uh, holding on to the bell of that jelly and eating little bits of food. And maybe they eat a little bit of, of the, the jellyfish glia them, themselves. I'm not exactly sure. You have to get the right person in here. Uh, this is a, a wonderful ice fish. They're being studied for quite a while. And these are the fishes that have uh, marvelous antifreeze proteins in their body fluids and in their blood to prevent them from freezing solid. They're uh, a spectacular organism. And just another shot here of some of the communities underneath the ice. You can see this dense group of sea anemones. In the background is anchor ice. And this is ice that forms on the sea bottom. And then after a while, it actually starts to break away and float up to the ice ceiling. And it actually lifts all the organisms with it, so effectively kills off this zone uh, where the anchor ice forms underneath the, underneath the sea ice. So I'd like to finish up with this, this last rather special image. I would like to take credit for it, but it's another one by Norbert Wu. And it actually shows me, and I'm swimming along, um, an iceberg that's grounded near Scott's Hut at Cape Evans. And when I look at this picture, it reminds me of a few things. It reminds me not only of these sort of wonderful adventures I've been able to have doing science around the world, it reminds me of the really large scale of the ocean. You know, if it's one of the few places I've seen, when you go into the Antarctic Ocean in the spring and the water's crystal clear, you can really see how, you know, a person is so tiny, you know, just absolutely dwarfed by even the smallest of icebergs. Ocean is a, just a huge place. And also when I look at it, it reminds me about all these very spectacular fragile communities that we find worldwide, but they tend to be just hidden from our eyes on land. So I think if we want to be really good stewards for our ocean planet, one of the first things we have to do is help people see and really appreciate all these marvelous communities that exist from the tropics to the poles. Thank you. I would. Um, There's, I'm almost reluctant to acknowledge people because there's so many people I'd, I'd love to acknowledge from uh, you know, over a decade here at Scripps. And these are just a few of them. But most importantly are my colleagues in the Innovative Marine Technology Lab. And that's Dr. Grant Dean, James Yolan, and Kerry Humphreys. They've been wonderful colleagues. And, and I can't imagine a, a more collegial group of people to work with. There's a whole pile of scientists that um, I've collaborated with around the world. Just marvelous people a whole pile of filmmakers and divers, and of course, everyone else here at Scripps. Um, I can't think of a better, more exciting, uh, more interesting group of people to work with. So thank you, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. Yeah, I've had a few close encounters. Um, actually, the worst, one of the worst things we've ever encountered was not, was not diving. It was in the boat. Um, we had a boat catch fire, sink, well, explode, and then sink underneath us. 
um, working off of Florida. We ended up being rescued by a Cuban fishing boat. Um, <laughs> so that had nothing to do with diving, but that was kind of a close call. Uh, yes? The question was, uh, he was asking about this invasive tunicate that's come from the Pacific coast of Panama into the Caribbean, where it doesn't have any predators. And I'm sure the Panama Canal has to do with part of the story. But the people who've actually studied the distribution of this invasive tunicate have actually tied it a little more closely to ballast water in large ships. And you know the ships will uh, exchange ballast water on either side of the canal. And then where the tunicate has shown up first and spread from in the Caribbean tend to be places that have oil refineries or uh, these kinds of things. So uh, I think for the tunicate, it's a little more closely associated with the shipping. Yes? The question was, is the Mexican government doing anything to mitigate some of the damages to the freshwater uh, water table? Um, at least in that area of Mexico, the development is proceeding so rapidly, um, and I believe money talks, and uh, more is going into development than actually managing the fresh water that's there and that is in jeopardy. Um, we're really seeing the water quality slide very quickly uh, in that part of Mexico. Uh, maybe way in the back. The question was, uh, what sort of equipment do we use? Um, the, the diving equipment we use, just regular off-the-shelf diving equipment, and then we use sometimes more specialized diving equipment if we're doing uh, this sort of uh, heliox diving or the rebreather diving that's a little more specialized. Um, I've used a series of different cameras over the years. Um, just regular 35 millimeter cameras to now digital cameras. Um, and the same thing with the cinematography, although that tends to now be uh, digital video. Um, and I, you know, I don't really know how to describe how we get sort of clear images, um, a lot of practice, and, and often what people don't realize, to get that one special little shot, um, you often wait for hours and hours. Um, on this last IMAX shoot, we would spend six or seven hours at a time stationary on the bottom waiting for that one thing to happen, waiting for that one scorpion fish to lunge at, the, lunge at its prey. Or I, I can remember spending hours waiting for the Christmas tree worms to sort of plume out like this from a coral just right. So it's, it's often just a lot of patience. The names of the IMAX films. <laughs> um, I've worked on Wild Ocean, which is, I believe, just left San Diego. And the next one it does not have a name yet. Um, <laughs> coming soon. I, I believe it's going to premiere in 2010. So not until next year. So thanks again for coming. Yeah, thank you very much.